Hello everybody, good afternoon uh, from Rome. My name is Miguel Castro and today I will be guiding you through the second RUS webinar which topic is flood monitoring with Sentinel-1 data. So uh, before starting let's uh, quickly have a look to uh, the objectives of this session, what you can expect. Uh, in this webinar you will learn the basics of image processing for flood mapping and for that we will use the RUS service to download, process, analyze and visualize the free data acquired by the Sentinel satellites. So just before starting also, uh, be aware that this webinar is going to be recorded and that you will be able to repeat the exercise by yourself. But don't worry about that, I will give you more details later on so that you can see exactly how to do that. Let's first have a, have a look at the outline of the, uh, for the next hour, hour and a half. We will uh, first have a look at the study area and some general information, as I said, about uh, floods. We will also cover a little bit the theory about remote sensing and uh, how it is used these type of situations. We will then uh, learn what is RUS and what can RUS do for your projects with Sentinel data, how uh, it can help you. And then we will use this service to perform our exercise uh, starting by downloading the images and uh, finishing by producing a final product uh, that can be used in that type of situation. And finally at the very end we will have some time for Q&A so 20 to 30 minutes more or less, not, not a fixed time and uh, well, uh, so you can send, if you have doubts during the webinar, uh, just send it to us through the uh, chat tool that you have and during that session we will start to, uh, to answer to you. So the duration for this webinar will be more or less one hour, 30 minutes. So now yes, let's uh, start and let's have a look about some general info. So. Among the different natural hazards, floods account for almost half of the weather-related disasters recorded during the last 20 years. The Republic of Malawi declared a state of disaster on January 13, 2015. Fifteen districts of the southern part of the country were affected due to heavy rains related to the cyclone Bansi and the tropical storm Tsetsa. So throughout December 2014 and January 2015, more than 150% of normal rainfall was experienced in the area. The flood left unfortunately 276 people dead, uh, 174,000 people displaced and some areas completely inaccessible. It also caused extensive damage to livestock, infrastructure and crops. In total, 64,000 hectares of land were damaged for the evening the humanitarian disaster that uh, happened. So how can we use, uh, in this situation, remote sensing or satellite data? Well, during a flood event, precise information is highly required by decision makers to improve response activities. They need the information as soon as possible so that they can manage properly the resources they have uh, to help the population. In this context, satellite Earth observation can play, can play a key role in order to provide that information. But flood, flood events are usually linked to cloudy conditions and this makes useless uh, optical remote sensing which relies in the uh, backscatter light that comes from the uh, sun and uh, this, this type of radiation cannot penetrate clouds. But there is a solution for that and that is synthetic, or, synthetic aperture radar. Uh, also known as SAR. As it does not depend on solar illumination or on weather conditions, SAR remote sensing is quite relevant then to monitor emergencies such as floods. So for this exercise we are going to be using uh, C-band Sentinel-1 SAR data provided by the uh, Copernicus program. The Sentinel satellites are included as I said in the space component of the Copernicus program of the European Union and the European Space Agency. And once completed, this program will be formed by six constellations of two satellites each, with a range of technologies from SAR to multispectral imaging. And last but not least, the data are freely available to any registered user, and that is a key feature in this new generation of Earth observation satellites. So, let's now move into the root service, and let's learn a little bit more about the, this project. So first of all, RUS stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products. It is an initiative funded by the European Commission and managed by the European Space Agency 
with the objective to promote the uptake of Copernicus Sentinel data and support R&D activities. The service uh, provides a free and open scalable platform in a powerful computing environment, hosting a suite of open source toolboxes pre-installed on virtual machines, which allow you to handle and process the data derived from the Sentinel satellites. So what does that mean in other words? Well, Bruce offers you a cloud computing solution that is a virtual machine with the necessary storage and processing capacity to deal with a large amount of data captured by the Sentinel satellites. In addition to all that, Bruce also provides you a specialized user help desk to support your remote sensing activities with Sentinel data and a dedicated training program. So, we have a couple of websites where we um, have all the information about this project. So let's have a look to those websites and let's learn a little bit more about the details of this uh, program. So, let's go first. Uh, we have the Bruce Training Portal, uh, where all the information about our training activities, such as this webinar, is uh, shown. And then we have the RusCopernicus.eu portal, where you can uh, subscribe to the service and perform your request for virtual machines, etc. But don't worry, I will show uh, you that right now. So let's go first to the uh, Roost Training Portal. So here we are. This is the homepage. Uh, we have some general information about the product, about the uh, project. We also have an intro video, uh, some news about the events. If uh, we go, for example, to the news tab, you can check here. The, our activity, what we are planning to do, so it's a good way to stay up to date and uh, don't lose any any activity or chance to, to receive this type of, of support. We also have the training tab where you can see the upcoming events. Right now we don't have uh, any one planned, but uh, don't worry, we will have uh, new uh, sessions very soon. Something very important is this past training sessions. If we click here, we can access the list of um, events that already took place. For example, the uh, flood mapping with Sentinel-1 last Tuesday, also another webinar with ship detection. And this is very important because if at some point you want to learn uh, something uh, and you didn't uh, manage to uh, subscribe for this webinar, you can come here, click on the webinar, and you will see the recorded video of that webinar and and some instructions to repeat the exercise by yourself within a course. So very, very relevant web page. The other one, it's uh, ruscopernicus.eu, and this is the main, the home page. So here we can see, for example, again, some news about the project, also the conferences we attend, uh, the events we organize. You can also see some basic info about Bruce service, such as what is exactly a Bruce, who can use it, and how does Bruce work, etc. Something uh, relevant is the Roos offer, and more in detail, the computing environment. So if we go here, and as I said before, the virtual machines of Roos come with a list of pre-installed software. So here you can have a look to this list, and you can know exactly what you can expect once you receive your virtual machine. So for example, we have so Earth observation software such as SNAP, we have also QGIS, uh, some uh, processing libraries very well known such as GDAL or FAIL toolbox and also software development tools such as R or Python and a very uh, and a long list. So you can you can have a look here to, to all this. Something also important to, to uh, highlight is the ICT resources. So when you apply for a virtual machine you we will ask you and you will see that later on uh, for details about your project. So what type of analysis are you going to do? What type of uh, data and storage capacity you need. And this is because based on that, you will receive a different virtual machine. So based on your needs, you will be at level A, B, or C. And as you can see in this table, you will have a different setting for processing and storage capacity. So here you can have all those details. Great. So um, let's um, Let's uh, start to interact with the root service, and to do so, the first thing we have to do is to register in, this, in the project. And for that, we go to the Login tab in this uh, right uh, upper corner of the website, and we click Login. So here we have two options. We can either register for the service or login. Of course, let's first register, and let me show you how you can do that. So very easy. We just need uh, to fill in the information 
here. So let's do it very quickly. So Okay, so uh, that's uh, basically all you need to have to do, all, all the things you have to specify, of course, the, the, um, the security code. And once you are done with that, we, you just need to click on register. So after the registration, you will receive a confirmation email to activate your account. And in that way, you are already a user of Roos and you can start to request the services we provide. So in my case, I'm not going to click register because I already have an account. But that will be the process if you are uh, a new a new user. So let's go back to uh, to the portal and let's now uh, log in to show you the uh, the web page. So we go to login again and we click login. We uh, specify our credentials and now we are we are logging the website. So first thing to note is that there is a new dedicated tab called your Roos service. So it is here where you can interact with, uh, with Roos and uh, start your project. So you have three options. Your profile where you have all the information you provided during the registration process. You also have your training in case you are invited to an event and uh, you can here insert the training code. But the relevant part is your dashboard. So let's have a look. So once you click on your dashboard, this is a, what you can see. So, so far, you can see that I have two projects. This is because I have already request a virtual machine. But in, uh, in your situation, if you register for the first time to Roos, you will not have, of course, any project yet. So you have to apply for that. And so let's, uh, let's uh, think that we don't have any project here. And what we should do is to request a new user service. So we click in this uh, tab here, and now, uh, request of information starts. So, as I said before, we need you to specify your your projects and the type of analysis you are going to do so that your the virtual machine that will be assigned to you meets your needs. Okay, let's go through this request to have a look how we can ask for that, that virtual machine. So, first thing, well, some uh, years of experience. If we have already worked with Copernicus data, or we have already processed that. And here, something very important. So as I said at the very beginning, you will be able to repeat this webinar. And how to do that is like that. You register in Roos and you request a virtual machine. And in the first step, we are asking you to introduce a training code. That training code, I will provide it to you at the end of this webinar. And by specifying it here, we will know already that you want to repeat this exercise and we will give you the virtual machine with the necessary data and a step-by-step -step guide so that you can follow the same exercise that I'm going to perform in a few minutes. So if we click here and we write, for example, the code, uh, we have two options. And we can say that we want to use the virtual machine only to repeat this exercise or that we want to use the virtual machine to repeat the exercise but also to keep working with our own projects. So let's use this uh, second option, for example. And let's go to next. So Next thing to do is to specify a little bit more about uh, what we are going to do. So first thing to say is the thematic area. So for today, we are going to select this one. Then the type of operation we are expecting. So let's say, for example, algorithm development. Uh, then we have to specify our preference. So the root service also provide uh, an option so that you don't have to download the data. So you can just send us the details about the data you need, and then once you have your virtual machine, everything will be stored there. So you, are, you can skip that part and focus on your analysis. But you can also, of course, say, okay, I want to download my own data, and then we'll just click self-downloading. Next thing will be some details about your activities and what you are expecting to do. So, well, you can uh, write whatever you want, but just remember the more details we have, the better we can understand your needs. And here's some uh, name for the project. So let's say flooding for today. And let's go to the next tab. So the last tab is to specify the data. Now, yes. So for example, 
So today we are going to use Sentinel-1 and we are going to use the GRD product. You can also specify Sentinel-2 and so on. Next thing would be to define our region of interest. So for example, for today, we are focusing in Malawi, in the south of Malawi. We can also specify the lat long longitudes, long coordinates, sorry, lat long coordinates, in case you know them. And of course, also upload a shape file with the study area. Finally, uh, define if we are going to perform a multi-temporal analysis or not. In our case, for today's exercise, we are performing a multi-temporal analysis and I will just specify the dates. We will start using an image at the very end of November 2014 and the last image will be March 2015. So we specified the, the, the period and then some more X details about uh, what we want to do. Okay, that will be all. Next thing to do, review uh, the details we have uh, specified. And if we agree with that, we just need to check the terms and conditions. So here you can have a look to exactly the details about how rules work and what, uh, what is our, well, for example, personal data privacy, etc. And if you do agree, submit a request and that's all. In that way, you have sent the request for your virtual machine and within a few days, the rules team will come back to you. They will communicate that your machine has been approved and they will give you the credentials to log in and then you can start to work with in, in rules. So let's have a look. So in my case, I'm not going to submit a request because I already have virtual machines. So I will skip that but that will be the process. So let's go back to your dashboard. And now, yes, after we have sent the request and after it has been approved, we have here our projects. In my case, the name is Rules Training 1. So we have a couple of different options. We can, the most important, we can access the virtual machine. We can also freeze it in case we are not going to be working for a while. We can even close the service before. And something also relevant is that we can ask for a complementary support. So in case you don't, you have doubts about Sentinel data, in case you don't know how, for example, Sentinel-1 can help you in your project or you have some technical questions about the data, you can come here, click and submit a request. So you explain us your doubt and then a team of remote sensing experts will come back to you with uh, some help. So as I said, the rules also offers this service apart from the virtual machine. So let's access our virtual machine so that we can start our exercise. So we click here in access my virtual machine and there we go, we have this login page. So as I explained to you before, once your request has been approved, they will send you the credentials for this virtual machine. So in that email, you will receive the information and you just need to copy paste that. Okay, so we put the information here and we log in. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we are into the virtual machine. Here we are in our virtual machine and this is a virtual machine based on Linux. So this is a typical Linux environment. So let me show you a little bit what you can expect. So we have, as in other computers, a file manager uh, where we can store our, our data. We also have a dedicated internet browser. In this case, it's Mozilla Firefox, so, well, internet connection. And uh, we have, as I said before, a predefined list of software. So here you can, you can see some examples. So we have Snap, QGIS, or Fair Toolbox with Monteverdi, R, etc. Of course, in the virtual machine, you have full admin rights. And that means that you can install whatever you want, either open source software or commercial software. Of course, for commercial options, you will need to have your own license, but you can do it. As far as the software is, let's say, uh, available for Linux, you can do it. And something also important to mention is your computer can interact with the virtual machine. That is, you can upload files to the virtual machine. You can download them from the virtual machine to your computer. And how to do that is very easy. We just need to press Control alt shift and then this menu appears. You can change here some settings about the input and about the mouse and uh, well, some other settings about the virtual machine, but the relevant part is devices. So we click here, we can access the folders of the virtual machine. And for example, if we go to a specific path of our interest, we can 
download or upload files. How to do that? Well, to download, we just need to select the file and double click and then a regular download will start and we have already a, the, the file in our computer. To upload files, once we are in the, uh, in the path where we want to store that uploaded file, we just click upload file and then select, for example, a PDF or, uh, or some data and then press uh, open. Okay, so that would be all for the intro to this virtual machine and let's now, yes, start our exercise. So for our application today, we are going to use four Sentinel-1A images. One before the flood event in December 2014 and three after the event in January, February and March 2015. In that way, we will analyze how the flood evolved during the time and how the water layer changes. And for the analysis, we will use the ESA SNAP software, the Sentinel-1 toolbox. And for the final visualization, we will be using QGIS. So let's start and let's do it by downloading the images. For that we open the uh, browser and we go to the Copernicus Open Access Hub. So as I mentioned at the beginning, Sentinel Data is free for registered users. So in case you don't have an account, go to sign up, fill in the information and you, your account will be created in five minutes. Something very quick to do. So if you already have the account, we go directly to login and we specify our credentials. Okay. So once we are in, we change to pan mode so that we can navigate through the map and we go to our area of interest. And today this is in the south of Africa and in the south of Malawi. So we zoom in a little bit. Okay. So here is our study area. Next thing to do is to define that region. For that we can either use box or polygon. Well, okay, today I'm going to use box. I will just define the polygon or the box, yeah. Great, so next thing, uh, let's specify the data we want. So, we want to download Sentinel-1 data. We want to do it from the end of December 2014 so December 2014, 29. And the last image will be at the end of March 2015. So let's put this. Great. So Sentinel-1 data. We want ground range detected products, that is GRT. And because we know that from uh, the uh, orbits of the satellite, and because we want to have the same geometry for all the images, let's specify the relative orbit number, which is 6 in our case. Okay, that's all. Let's now search for the, the images, and we do that by clicking on the search button. Great. So here we have the list of products. You can uh, also see on the map the footprint of those images. They are quite large. Uh, you can expand the list to have uh, a better look of what is available and, for example, some metadata about the image such as the mission, the uh, sensing date or the size of the file you can download. So now we just need to identify the images we want. So we want the one, we want this one, end of March, so that is 23 of March. We also want one at the end of February, that is 27 of February. The one before the flood, the 29 of this December, and then one right after the flood, the 22 of January. So to download the images, we just need to click on the download button here. So you can see if I move to another product, this uh, arrow here. You can also have a look uh, to the details of the image by clicking on this eye. Uh, this will give you uh, metadata about the instrument, the product, etc. So let's start the download process just by clicking here. So this pop-up window appears, we save, we save the file, we click OK. So the download process is limited to two images each time. So I'm going to start the process for two of them, but I will not wait since I have already downloaded the images for this exercise. But the process will be to wait until the two images are downloaded and then start again two others. Of course, you can automatize that in other ways, but okay, for today we are leaving it like that. So we have already our images downloaded in the virtual machine. Now we can start our analysis. And for that, let's open SNAP, the SNAP software. 
there it goes. So first, and before starting, in case you are not familiar with SNAP, this is the uh, first uh, layout that you can see. We have here the product explorer section, where a list of products will appear as soon as we, as soon as we start to work with, uh, with the images. We also have some options in the lower left corner, such as quick looks of the image. You will see there once we open it, color manipulation to change the colors, uh, the world view to locate the product in the globe, uh, etc. We also have the main area where the image will be displayed. And of course, we have dedicated tools for rust data, optical images, and radar images as the one we are using today. So let's open the images. And for that, we can go to File, Open Product, or we can directly click on the Open Product icon. So let's do like that. We need to navigate to the path where we have uh, stored our images. This is the one for, in my case. And let's select all the images. So in Sent with Sentinel-1 data, there is no need to unzip the folder that you download from the Copernicus Hub. Snap can work with that structure, so uh, we can select directly the zip folders and click Open. Great. So as soon as you do that, here in the Product Explorer, we see the list of images. As I mentioned to you, we have here the location in the world view, and they all have the same geometry, as you can see. So in the product name, you can see that the date appears after those key information. So we have here 2015, 02, 27. So that's in us from February and so on. So let's open the image from January, the one that that, uh, that is after the flood. And for that, we expand the product. We can click here in this little arrow. And we see several folders. So those folders contain metadata about the image, uh, quick looks, etc. But the relevant one so far is the bands folder. It is here where we have the image. So we select bands and we expand it. And we have both amplitude and intensity. So let's double click on amplitude to have a look. And let's do the same for the image in December 2014 so that we see also how was the situation before the flood. So we do the same, we expand the product, we go to the bands folder and we open, we double click on amplitude VV. Great, so the images will uh, start to, to they, they, will, they will appear. They are a little bit big, so it might take a while, not that much, but okay, this is something that, that you have to know. Uh, Sentinel-1 data is, they are, they are quite large, so it takes a couple of, few seconds. Okay, so there we go. Here we have our image of January. So we see the regular appearance of a SAR image, white to black, we have a very big uh, dark region here in the uh, upper right corner that is a lake. But we want to focus in our flooded area. And for that, let's first synchronize the two images so that we can see it at the same time. For that, we go to Windows, Tile Horizontally. And now you see that if I move around one of the images, and for that I select the Pan Mode, both views are synchronized. And I want to zoom in into the flooded area. And for that, I use the zoom tool. I select the area, and that's all. So we can see here the difference between the image of January, which is in the left side, and the image of December, which is in the right side. <laughs> so we see very big differences. Those dark regions are flooded area. This is water. And this is the information we want to extract from the Sentinel-1 image. We want to extract that, that layer, that mask, that water mask, so that we can use it in our uh, response to that emergency. Great. So let's do, let's do that. So as I said before, we are going to perform the same analysis for the four images. So we are going to pre-process them in the same way. And for that, we are going to take advantage of the batch processing option of SNAP. It allows this option to define a processing chain by creating a graph and then apply it to the set of images. So let's do that. And let's close, first of all, those images. And let's go to Tools, Graph Builder. So here we are going to start to add operators. And those operators will perform the preprocessing for us. So we have, first of all, a read and write option. And in between, we are going to place all the steps. So we are going to, to start with a subset. So 
we do not want to work with the whole image because it's pretty big. We want to focus on our area. And in that way, by reducing the spatial extent of the image, we are also improving processing time of further analysis. So to include the subset operator, we right click on the graph builder, we go to add raster geometric subset. That will be the first thing to do. Our next step will be apply orbit file. So we are doing apply orbit file because the orbit state vectors provided in the metadata of a SAR product, such as Sentinel-1, are generally not accurate and can be refined with the precise orbit files which are available days to week after the generation of the product. The orbit files provide accurate satellite position and velocity information, improving the analysis that requires satellite information to be as precise as possible. So how to do that? We right click again, add radar apply orbit file. Great. So our next step now will be thermal noise removal. Thermal noise in SAR imagery is the background energy that is generated by the receiver itself. It skews the radar reflectivity towards higher values and hampers the precision of radar reflectivity estimates. Level 1 products, uh, such as the one we are using today, provide a noise lookup table for each measurement data set and that can be used to remove the noise from the product. So it's another type of calibration of the image and for that again we go to right click add radar radiometric thermal noise removal. So we place it here. Great. So then our next step will be a basic step in SAR preprocessing which is called calibration. So the objective of uh, SAR calibration is to provide imagery in which the pixel values can be directly related to the radar backscatter of the scene. Uncalibrated SAR imagery is sufficient for qualitative use, but calibrated SAR images are essential to quantitative use of SAR data. So the power of the received radar signal also accounts for factors such as antenna gain or system loss and this introduces a significant radiometric bias in the SAR image. The radiometric calibration is done by calculating the sigma naught coefficient, which is also known as the normalized radar cross-section coefficient. And how to do that? Again, very easy. Right-click, go to Add Radar Radiometric Calibration. Great. Next thing in our Preprocessing of the Sentinel-1 image will be to do speckle filter. So, speckle noise-like feature is a common phenomenon in SAR systems. It's also known as the uh, salt and pepper effect. It confers to SAR images a granular aspect and random spatial variation, and might decrease the utility of SAR imagery by reducing the ability to detect ground targets and obscuring the recognition of spatial patterns. The source of this noise is attributed to random interference between the coherent returns and the principle of speckle filtering is to reduce the variance of the complex speckle scattering and improve the estimate of the scattering coefficient. Okay, so how to perform this step in SNAP? Again, right click, add radar, speckle filtering, speckle filter. Not multi-temporal because we are only working with one image. Great, so that's speckle filter. And now we are ready for the last step of our pre-processing, which is terrain correction. So why terrain correction? Well, because of the side looking of, of SAR systems, every target located on the terrain being observed by the radar will be mapped onto the slant range domain. And moreover, due to topographical variations of the scene, SAR images are likely to be affected by geometric distortions such as layover, shadows, etc. So the terrain correction is the process by which SAR data are converted from slanted range to ground range geometry and in a defined cartographic system and that's relevant. So let's add the operator again by right clicking add radar geometric terrain correction terrain correction yes. So we click and the operator will appear. Here it is. Okay, great. So this is going to be the, our pre-processing of Sentinel-1 images. 
And now we just need to connect those operators so that the input, sorry, so that the output of one is used as input for the next one. And for that, we right click and we say connect graph. Okay, so once uh, we do that, we have those red arrows that are connecting the uh, steps. And now we can save the graph. So for that, we click on the save button here and we go to uh, to the path where we want to save it. In our case, it's called AUX data. And let's call it uh, SAR pre processing. Okay, so we save it. And now we can start our batch processing. So we have defined the methodology to apply to the images. Now let's import the images and apply that methodology. For that, we are going to close the graph. We are going to open the batch processing option of SNAP. For that, we go to tools, batch processing, just below graph builder, batch processing. And here we have the, the menu. So first thing to do is to add the images. For that, we have two options, either click here and navigate to the path where we have the images or click here where the images that are already in SNAP will be added. So let's use this option. And here we have the four images that are, that are in the product explorer. Let's also refresh these uh, images so that the metadata is displayed. And we do that by clicking in the refresh button or icon here. So now we see the type of the product appears, the acquisition time, the track, orbit, etc. Okay, next thing to do is to load the graph, the graph that we previously saved. So we go to load graph and we load the graph that is called SAR preprocessing. Okay, and now we see that in the upper part of batch processing we have all the operators that we have defined before. That is great, this is what we want. So now before running, we have to make sure that we are specifying the correct parameters for each operator. And let's do that, starting by subset. So, we're going to subset the image using pixel coordinates today because we have all the images in the same geometry. We are using the relative orbit number six. In case you don't have the same geometry, in case you have images that are not in the same position, you can use geographical geographic coordinates. But okay, for today, we are using this option and for that let's specify the numbers okay give me a second with that okay uh, let's now go to apply orbit file we don't need to change any setting here because the uh, software will recognize the image directly and will download the precise information about the satellite position and velocity. So we we need that we don't need um, to change anything. The next thing will be thermal noise removal. Here again, no need to change anything. The default val uh, values are okay. The next step will be calibration. So calibration, as you can see, the option of output sigma zero, sigma not band is selected already, so leave it as default. Next, spec on filter. In this case, we are changing the filter. We are not using Li Sigma, but Li. And for that, we will be using a window size of 7 by 7. Okay. And finally, in terrain correction, we just need to specify the map projection that we want. So you can leave the rest of the uh, parameters as default. And to change the map projection, we go to map projection. We select here the option. And let's specify UTM zone. So for that we go uh, we go down and we select UTM automatic. So the software will check where the image is located and will match it with the appropriate UTM uh, zone. In our case, if we click OK, we see that it is zone 36 south. Okay, great. Uh, let me just check the subset coordinates. I think I forgot. Yes. Okay. Let me just change those numbers very quickly. Okay. Okay. And we put the width and the height. Okay, great. So we are almost done. We just need now to check that we are saving our um, results 
in the, an appropriate path. And for that, we go to the input output parameters tab and we check that the directory is correct. In our case, it is, but just double check uh, in case uh, it is not. And this is very important. Why? Because we are using the option keep source product name. So if you do, if the output folder is the same as the input folder where the images are stored, the products will be overwrite, overwritten. And this is this is very, very relevant. Be aware of that because you can lose your inputs by overwriting them. So just check that you are not using the same destination folder. Okay, in our case we are not, so we are ready to go. Uh, for today's exercise, I'm not going to perform the analysis for all the images. The process doesn't take that much. I think it's max five minutes. But uh, for convenience, I'm going to perform the analysis just on the images, on the image of January. And for that, I'm going to remove the other one. So to remove an image, we just click on the image and we select minus. And OK. So batch processing is ideal for to process several images, but OK. In that way, you know how to do it. The process will be will be the same. So let's click on run and let's run the process. So it will not take that much, although we have a lot of steps because Snap do not save each intermediate step. So the only file, let's say, that will be created in your virtual machine will be the output of the whole graph, and all the steps in between will be virtually saved on the on the um, software. And in that way, the, the process can be run much, much faster, as you can see. Great. So it's done. Let's close batch processing. And now we have already the uh, image of January that has been processed. You can see here in the world view uh, that the extent of the image number five, it's smaller because we, we, we use subset. Great. So let's expand the product. And let's go again to the bands folder and let's open sigma zero sigma not vv, which is the output of the calibration. Okay, we double click and here we have the image. Okay, it has been processed according to our chain. And now let's zoom in a little bit to have a closer look. So we can identify those dark regions. Those are the flooded areas after the event. And now what we need to do is to create a water mask that we can use in our ana in further analysis. And how to do that? Well, that's something easy. And for today, we are going to use, as I said, an easy but effective method known as binarization. So flooded areas will have a lower backscatter coefficient than non-flooded areas since they tend to create a smooth surface where the SAR signal is reflected according to, to Snell's law and that is acting as a specular reflector. So such reflection returns very little signal strength back to the satellite, resulting in a dark region on the image. And taking advantage of that, we can classify the image as water, non-water, by setting a threshold to create both classes. We select, to select that threshold, we can uh, use different methodologies. There are very advanced ones that you can check on, on, uh, on papers and on the literature, but today, uh, we are selecting that threshold by inspecting the pixel values over dark areas in the image and then use it to create a water mask. And to select that threshold, we are also going to use the histogram of the image and the statistics. So let's do it. First of all, let's zoom in a little bit more into a dark region, for example, here. Okay. And let's now check the pixel values. And how to do that? It's, it's again very easy. We just go right next to the uh, Product Explorer tab, we have Pixel Info. So if we click here, and now we move the mouse over a dark region, we will see that the pixel values are shown in this area here. We have Sigma 0 VV, and then we have a number of intensity. So check that area. If I move my mouse, we have the pixel value. So as you can see, it's very low, 0 0.005. Okay, six, six, seven, very low value. If I now go to uh, a non-dark area, for example, here in this white one, I have 0 0.2 or 0 0.14. I mean, it changes, but, but we see already that uh, there is a big difference uh, in pixel values. Okay, so 
that might be a little bit random to select the threshold just by uh, going over a dark region. So let's improve a little bit this part. And for that, we are going to upload some polygons that will overlay on top of the dark regions. And once we have those polygons, we will check the statistics of the pixel values below those polygons to have a better idea of uh, which threshold we can select. So let's upload those polygons. In SNAP, you can create the polygons by yourself. We have here this option and you can uh, create your polygon. It's very easy. But okay, today I'm, uh, I have already those polygons created, so I will use them. So for that, we select the product number five and we go to vector import as reshape file. We navigate to the path where we have the polygons, in this case, Auxeta, and we select the file, Water Polygon. It's a shape file. We click Open, and we select No in this pop-up menu. And there we go. We have some polygons over the image. Make sure that you have the same projection, both in the shape file and the uh, image, just to avoid error. It might not cause a problem, but it's always better to be on the safe side. So um, you see, I have a couple of polygons here, two others over here, and uh, one more here. So now let's check the statistics, as I said, uh, of the pixels that are below those polygons. And for that, we go to Analysis, Statistics. Great. Now we need to select Use Region of Interest. We select this, and we select that our region of interest is the shapefile that we have uploaded, that is the water polygon shapefile. We select it, and don't forget to refresh, because if not, no statistics, no statistics will be shown. Great, so now we have here two histograms about the image. We also have uh, a table with the mean, max, sigma, median, etc. So in that way, we can better characterize our dark regions and we can better choose a threshold. So today I'm going to use the maximum pixel value over, uh, of the pixels uh, below my polygons and that is, so no sorry, so today I'm going to, uh, I'm going to check the mean value, I'm going to check also max and mean and based on that I can decide my threshold. So let's also have a look, as I, as I explained to you before, to the histogram of the image. If we go to the lower left corner and we select color manipulation, we can see the histogram of the image. Of course, it's not very visible, but don't worry, we can stretch it. For that, we select stretch horizontally. Great. And here we have our image, our histogram, sorry. So if we uh, move a little bit, we can see that by playing with the color uh, display, we can uh, we can we can check that our threshold is working properly to differentiate between uh, water areas and non-water areas. So in that way, we can also be sure that the value that we are selecting is correct. Okay. So for today's exercise, I'm using a value of 0 0.02. Uh, and I'm going to create a condition based on that. And how to do that? Well, we go to the number, to the product number five. We are going to create our water mask based on this input, and we right click on the product. We select the band math, and we set a name for the new layer that we are going to create. I'm gonna call it water mask, okay? We uncheck virtual because we want to save this layer. We don't want to be we don't want the layer to be virtual. And now we can define the expression. For that, we go to edit expression and we select and, and, and we write if sigma zero VV, sigma not VV, is smaller than our threshold, then assign to those pixels the value two, for example. And uh, if not, let's assign no data to the rest. So if your expression is correct, you will have a confirmation message here in green, OK, no errors. So we click OK, and again we click OK. And the virtual band will be created automatically. So as, of the, you, you, can, uh, as you can see, we can see uh, still the polygons. You can remove them from the uh, layout by going to Layer Managers in the right side of the uh, software of SNAP and uncheck Vector. 
Okay, so now that we have this water mask, let's compare it to our original image, uh, the product number five. And let's do uh, that as in the beginning by going to Windows, Tile Horizontally. Great. And now let's zoom to see how effective our threshold is. Okay. So uh, let's move a little bit and let's let's remove the polygons also here. Again, layer manager and click vectors. Yeah. Let's zoom a little bit more. Okay. So as you can see, um, the white area here is the uh, are the pixels classified as water and the gray or dark or black area is no data. So you can see that it's quite precise. We can see that, for example, even this area that is not uh, black in the original image is not classified as water. We can also see here the same. So you, of course you can move around the image and check uh, the quality of that in some areas, but, but okay, we, we can already have an idea of how accurate our thresholding or our binarization has been. Of course, the threshold, the binarization is a, let's say, trial and error process. You can improve it, you can change uh, the threshold a, a little bit, increase it, decrease it, and this will definitely affect the water mass that you are creating. So, that's something to play with and, and you can check that and how this influence, for example, the area, the total area that is classified as water. Okay, so we are happy enough with uh, our water mask. Let's now uh, visualize it in a better way, in a better way using QGIS. And let's also visualize the water mask that I have created previously uh, for the images of December, February, and March. So as I told you during the batch processing, I didn't process those images. Because I've done it, I've done that before. So this process, I've done it before for the rest of the images. Now let's go directly to see the results of the four images. So the result of the multi-temporal analysis. So for that, let's uh, minimize, snap, and let's open QGIS. We double click on the icon, and the software will open. Okay, there we go. So here we have QGIS. Let's open then, um, oh sorry, I forgot to mention, uh, sorry for that. Once you are in SNAP and you, you, uh, you have your water mask, of course you have to export it so that you can open it in QGIS. That's something that I forgot. So once you are here, you have to export that result. And how to do that is very easy. We just select the water mask and we go to File, Export, and you can select uh, a lot of different formats, for example, your diff. You can also in, in the display, you can right-click over the water mask and select export view as image. Uh, be sure that you select full scene, full resolution, that you select the appropriate format that you want to use and that you are in the appropriate path. For example, I, I am, so that's processing, okay, and let's call it, for example, uh, water mask January. And we save it, okay. So the active file, active browser uh, of this water mask will be created. So as I said, I've done that already for the image of December, uh, February, and March. So let's have a look to those results in QGIS now, yes. So we minimize map and we open, minimize map and we open QGIS. And now let's open those raster files that we have exported from Snap. So that we go to um, our um, our um, destination folder where we have saved the uh, diffs, and there we go. We have water mask January, but also the one from December, February, and March. So let's select all of them and click open. So here we have the the four products. They will be displayed uh, right now. Okay. And let's zoom a little bit to see uh, how the flooded area evolves during the time. So, let me start by showing you the water mask created from in December. So, here we can see those blue areas are, let's say, permanent water bodies or water bodies that were present, present at least in December, so before the flood. Let's now see what's the water mask in January, the one we have done right now. 
and let's see uh, the result. So we just put it here, and we see that the flooded area has, I mean, the, the flooded area is, is quite big compared to the original uh, water bodies of December. Those red areas are areas classified as water by our methodology, and we can see that the affected area is quite big. We can move around a little bit and see uh, how this is affecting other areas. Let's now have a look to the image uh, of March. Let's see how the flood evolved in March. For that, we select water mask March and we uh, check it. Okay, uh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> not March, Je uh, February, February. Yes, February is after January. <laughs> so we, uh, so here we have, so we can see February, uh, February is in um, yellow. We can see that some areas are being flooded from the image in January to the image in uh, February and that the total extension of the flood is still increasing a little bit. Of course, not that much as in uh, January, but okay, still some areas are being uh, affected. And now, if uh, we check the, yes, the image from March, let's check it and let's, let me show it to you properly. And for that, I'm going to compare it to February, only to February. And why? Well, because in March, we can see that the flooded area is already decreasing. So we have in yellow, February, and in purple, March. And you can see that the uh, water mask identified by our methodology is not the same, is not expanding, is actually doing the opposite thing. So in that way, uh, we can see the evolution of this process and we can improve our response, our emergency response, etc. So that's all for the analysis of the data. Of course, uh, af um, of course, after that you can still perform other GIS analysis. For example, we can uh, use OpenStreetMap open data uh, to have some base map and uh, contextualize a little bit more our results. And for that, in QGIS, we have a nice plugin called OpenLayers Plugin. We uh, go to Web, OpenLayers Plugin, OpenStreetMap, OpenStreetMap. And by clicking here, uh, this um, base map will be displayed. And that's great, because in that way, we can locate, uh, for example, some urban areas. You will see it right now. Uh, you can, mm, you can uh, locate if the flooded area is near a urban area, if there are some roads that are affected, some railroads, some uh, fields, etc. And that's great. Of course, you can import your own trade files, you can perform your own analysis, such as buffers around, for example, settlements to see how far, or what's the distance between a flooded area, and what could be the risk if that area expands, etc. So you can perform a lot of analysis. So from, from here, you can start, let's say, more GIS things uh, uh, after you have done this remote sensing analysis of the SAR Sentinel-1 image. So, that is all for the exercise. Let me just highlight a couple of take-home messages that I think are relevant for, uh, for today. And for that, let me just go back to my presentation. So, in this exercise, we have used Sentinel-1 SAR data to monitor a flood event in Malawi. For that, we have used the virtual machines provided by the Roost service. And those virtual machines come with pre-installed open source software ready to use. And in addition to that, the root service also offers to all registered users a dedicated help desk supported by a team of remote sensing experts to help you in your projects with Sentinel data. So let's imagine you are working with uh, Sentinel-1 for, flood, for flood mapping applications and you have some doubts, well, you can contact us and we will help you. Uh, let me give you some extra information about our training activities. We will have another webinar at the beginning of December, but this time we are asking you to decide the topic. So if you want to participate, follow us on Twitter or create an account in case you don't have it and vote on the poll that we have created for this occasion. The deadline is the 14th of November. We have three options. You can go there, check it, choose the one you like the most. And of course, once the application for the webinar is open, register for the webinar. Um, now, in case you want to repeat this exercise by your own, 
what would be the procedure? Go, go to the uh, Rus training, sorry, ruscopernicus.eu, uh, register in the service, apply for a virtual machine, and as I showed you at the beginning, uh, in the uh, in the uh, request process, you have to introduce the code. So the code for this training is HAZA01, um, a HAZA from Hazards. Uh, so you can specify the code there, and in that way, we know already the Sentinel-1 images you need, the AUX data you need, and you will have also a step-by-step -step guide to do the analysis. You, of course, next week the uh, webinar is going, it, it, it's being recorded, so next week it, it will be available in our Roost training page, so you can also use the video as a step-by-step -step guide, but okay, in case you prefer some paperwork, you have it there. So uh, that's all from my side. As I said, my name is Miguel Castro. It has been a pleasure for me. I really hope that you have learned something new today. Uh, thank you also to the uh, rest of the Roost team that has been involved in this webinar. Um, quite a lot of work. Thank you again. Uh, hope you have enjoyed this webinar. And uh, well, I'll see you in the next one. Ciao.